Welcome to episode three of Exploring the Calf. I'm joined today by Sergeant Tonkin. Sergeant Tonkin is a regular forest material management technician with one service battalion in Edmonton, Alberta. He has served with the military since 2002 and been deployed on four international operations. So Sergeant Tonkin, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Awesome, thank you for being here. So let's just jump right in. I think we're all curious about how you got involved in the military. Um, can you just tell us why you joined and why you chose material management? Um, <clears throat> so for me, um, 9-11 had happened the year before. Um, and it, we all watched that on TV. Um, and then the war on terror happened. We watched that on TV. Um, and I just got feeling that I wanted to do something. So I originally looked at joining the reserves. Um, so I went to the armory in Guelph, Ontario, um, and was quite surprised at how many jobs there are in the CAF that are not combat related. Right. Um, so that kind of surprised me a little bit. And then at the time, um, married with two little kids working in a factory in Fergus, Ontario. And every day you went into work, it was, we're closing the plant were laying off people. When you're fifth from the bottom of the seniority list, you're getting laid off. <laughs> so then I started thinking, well, why not do it full time? So when I applied, um, I did the aptitude test and they're like, congratulations, you can do anything you want in the cap. <laughs> uh, then we went through the medical and I had applied for, um, talked to some people from my hometown who were in, um, they recommended some Hard Air Force trades, spec pay, um, you know, hotels, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little cushy, um, but maybe better suited for a young family. And uh, then I did my medical and I'm colorblind. Oh, yeah. Right. So it went from congratulations, you can do anything you want to congratulations, here's five trades you can pick from. Mm -hmm. So at the time, it was a supply technician. Um, we've since changed the name to material management technician. Um, but I was kind of doing that in the factory. I was a stock handler. I was driving forklifts. I was, you know, delivering paper to and from presses and the printing company and stuff like that. So it was a very similar type job and a very easy switch over. So that's what I picked and, and went from there. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Like not many people know about non-combative roles in the military. So that's another reason why I'm really excited to have you on. And I saw that material management technicians are in demand right now. Um, so I was just hoping you could give us kind of like an overview of what you do, what you like about your career. Um, sell it to so, us. <laughs> the, <laughs> the thing about, about material management is that it's a very diverse trade. Um, we can do anything from um, simple receipts and issues of, of items. You can work in the local purchasing uh, section, the LPO as a buyer. Um, so you're buying the commodities and then it goes to the receipt section, which is material people as well. And they do the receipts um, and get the items out to the other units that have bought them. You can work in clothing stores, issuing the clothing to all the members. Um, you can work um, in rations and POL. Um, you're also involved with material management, meaning stock taking and making sure that everything is accounted for and all the proper accounts are done at the proper time and everything is, is uh, any deficiencies are reported up the chain of command. Um, we do, um, you get to drive a forklift. If you're lucky enough, you get to drive an RTFL or a zoom boom when we're out in the field doing exercises and, and on deployments. Um, you work in spare parts. It's just, there's so many things you can do that um, uh, it's a very diverse trade. And, and that's what I like about it. And what kind of skills do you think um, maybe coming from the civilian side would help you in this role? Um, I think the big thing is you have to be able to um, absorb a lot of knowledge. A lot of it does kind of transfer over. So once you learn how to do say receipts and issues, other sections you go to, you're going to do receipts and issues. Um, so that you, you need to be able to absorb that information. But then there's 
um, in the LPO world, there's a lot of legalities um, that scare people away because you're spending, you know, taxpayers' money. So you want to make sure you're doing it properly, um, and people get worried. It's it's not as hard as it as it seems. Um, once you once you study it and you take the courses, you you know um, you know what you can and can't do, and you have people around you to ask questions. So I think that's a big skill is is to be able to not be afraid to ask a question if you don't know. I mean, I've been doing this for going on twenty years, and I don't know everything about about the trade. Like I I, I like to think I know most, but there's definitely going to be a question that comes up, and that's for me part of the fun is we are a big trade. There's a lot of us. So it's easy to talk to your colleagues and, and bounce ideas off of them on, you know, what do you think about this? Can we do that? Or how do we go about fixing this problem? And so being a problem solver is a, is a great skill, um, being motivated to learn and to ask questions. And I think one of the things for me that um, our trade needs more of is more, um, you have to be willing to share your knowledge as well. Um, we are a big trade, so I understand sometimes people, you want to progress, you want to move up in ranks and, and that, so there's a tendency to maybe hold a little bit of knowledge to yourself so that you can, you can exceed. Um, for me, I would rather, as a senior NCO, I want to see my, my troops that are actually working for the team and making the team stronger and better by sharing their knowledge. Right. That makes a yeah. lot especially in such a big, um, I was watching the little trailer on the forces website and it seems like, like you said, there's a huge breadth of these supply technicians working across different branches even. Um, and I just actually interviewed a sailor. The Navy looks pretty cool. I'm wondering like, why you chose the army. <laughs> um, well, so I originally chose air force, oh, okay. um, because like my friends had said, it's, uh, cushy yeah. um the the problem i guess with with our trade is it's what we like to term a purple trade meaning just because i'm army um like i spent five years in trenton on an air force base mm. um in theory i could get posted to a boat or to a, a, a navy base so it doesn't really matter what element you are you could end up i mean we like to think they try to put you know, if you pick Navy, you probably picked it for a reason. So we'll try to put you in that doesn't always work out that way. Um, I was fortunate enough after my tour in 2006, that when I came home, um, one of the little perks that unfortunately with COVID and, and budgets, I don't know how much it happens anymore, but um, sports is big in the military, obviously. Oh, right. um, so I got lucky enough to be the backup goalie for the Edmont or for the Prairie region ball hockey team. So I ended up in uh, Shearwater for ball hockey nationals. <laughs> um, so that was pretty cool. But we got a tour of a, of a ship that was in dock in Halifax. And um, for me personally, there is no way you're getting me on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> uh looking at their sleeping um you you can barely lift your head off the, yeah no I'm, I'm i'm good i'll I'll take the tranche at 4 a.m thanks <laughs> wow yeah it seems pretty squishy in there not for someone who's claustrophobic that's for sure yeah yeah it's pretty tight it is pretty tight um but you know what having said that every person that i know who spent time on a boat has absolutely loved it so fair enough so so there's that side of the coin yeah, definitely. The the sailor I was talking to definitely preferred the Navy. He first tried to join the Army, and he was like, thank goodness that didn't happen, because <laughs> he really <laughs> likes his environment. So, I find a lot of it is what you what you know. Like for me, so my first posting was Edmonton. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, things have relaxed a little bit here, but at that time, I can remember somebody cutting across the grass and I remember seeing somebody stop their car and get out and yell at them to get off the grass. Um, and then I got, <laughs> then I got posted to Trenton and in the air force world, there's a path through the grass to cut <laughs> off the sidewalk. So it, it was a very different world. So I was used to the more harsh of the army. And the one thing for people, when I was first here, my first time as a, you know, as a, you know, no hook private, brand new troop. Um, everyone was always like, God, I hate wearing PT all the time. It's the same thing, the same shorts, the same t-shirt, blah, blah, blah. 
then I went to Trenton and they, at Trenton anyway, I'm not sure on other Air Force bases, but they didn't have PT strip. They oh. just wore civvies or PT. So they went for a run and in Trenton, there's no trails on the base really to run on. Mm -hmm. So you run through town. Oh, so it really God. just looks like a group of people running through town. Whereas, so that kind of gave me an appreciation for PT strip because you look professional. Mm -hmm. You have, you all have the same shirt on, you all have relatively the same shorts, you know, black or blue or whatever your unit tells you the color they prefer, but you look professional. You're running through town in a, in, you know, in ranks as a group, it, it looks professional. Whereas when I went there, I saw these guys running and I'm like, well, I know you're military, but that looks like crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. No, no offense to my Air Force guys. They love their non PT shirt. But <laughs> yeah. If you're watching this and you're in the Air Force and you want to do an interview, let me know. <laughs> yeah, don't get me wrong. My, my, like I, I was used to army. So going to the Air Force was a shock. I know from Air Force people who went the opposite way and showed up on an army base, it's a big shock to them as well. And they don't, they don't get it. Um, I appreciate it. I did an exercise in um, Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, stayed in a hotel. I mean, yeah, you know, it's, there's advantages to the hotel. <laughs> not, not gonna lie. But um, yeah, I guess what you start out with, you figure it out, you get comfortable. It, it's what you know when you go somewhere different, you kind of, you either appreciate that more and be like, okay, hotels are the life for me. Or you're like, you know what? I kind of miss the, you know, the five, six guys in a tent because you have a little tighter camaraderie instead of everybody having their own. Yes, it's great to have a shower and, you know, porcelain and TV and a, queen size bed that's all great but you're kind of in your room for me the army yes I'm on a cod and yes I could be freezing my ass off but at the end of the day I'm there with the, the bond is for me is a little bit tighter mm -hmm. yeah that makes and sense that's, that's, yeah yeah so I think just jumping back a little bit to training because I know a lot of people watching this they're new recruits. So they're always wondering like, what's the training like? And for you, I know it was in 2002. So things might've changed a little bit, but if you don't mind just kind of walking us through what it was like for you back then. Um, basic was interesting. Um, I didn't really appreciate basic until I was probably on the bus heading to Borden from St. Jean. Um, I hit the Christmas break. So I got to kind of do half of what was it week eight I think it was I did it kind of half Monday to Wednesday and then we had Thursday to clean up Friday we were gone for Christmas break and then we came back and it was kind of get back into things so but basic was one of those things that I tell people it's like when you're in it it kind of sucks there's moments that it that it kind of sucks the sooner you figure out how to play the game the better off you'll be mm. um uh, <laughs> I joined at 30, so I was a little older. Um, so one thing that I had that I figured out very quickly was that on um, lower rank inspections, things weren't weren't quite so bad. Like when it was a, you know, the course warrant or the commandant or somebody, we made sure everything was like as good as we could get. It. But when the master corporal or master bombardier was coming through, um, I learned quickly that leave something for him to yell at you about. And then he leaves you alone. <laughs> That's funny. So we weren't allowed to eat. Technically, we weren't supposed to eat in our rooms in, in the mega in St. Jean. So what I, one day what I did was I took a Snickers wrapper and I put it in my DEU jacket pocket. Oh. And he stuck his hand in the pocket and lost his ever loving mind. <laughs> and then he left. And my inspection was about five seconds. <laughs> That's so so it worked out well <laughs> yeah yeah it was uh basic was one of those things that in the middle I remember getting on the so I took a train from Toronto to Montreal and then a bus mm -hmm. I think I called the master corporal on the bus sir at least twice the third maybe the third time he yelled at me um I remember going on the bridge going over the St. Lawrence looking out the window thinking what the hell am I doing Mm -hmm. like what am I doing <laughs> um but like I said at the end of it all on the bus to Borden 
um, we had a good time on the bus and a, a lot of great memories and made a lot of really, really, you make really close, fast friends. Hmm. Um, just because it's a high stress thing and you, you figure things out really quickly. From there, uh, we go to Borden for my trade um, and do our QL3s, uh, trade training, basic trade training. Um, and that is for material management tech, that's all on computers. You're in a computer lab, you're, you're learning. Um, back then it was slightly painful because they have to go at the level of the lowest person. So we were literally starting at, okay, you take your mouse to the bottom left corner and click on start. And then it's like, are you kidding me? But that's just, you have to teach that way because you don't know where everybody is. Right. Um, from there we're posted. So then I was posted to Edmonton. Um, and then you ideally move around to different sections to learn different parts of your trade, kind of your OJT or QL4 qualification. Mm -hmm. um, I went overseas. Um, from my first year at Afghanistan 2006, and I worked in customer service um, overseas. Um, that was excellent. I learned a lot about the trade in that job. I think that job really um, set me that I had picked the right trade and that I wanted to do this um, for my career. I came home from that and I got posted to um, one uh, CER, um, one combat engineer regiment in the uh in the rqms there and that was fantastic as well and then we go on our ql5s training back to borden so i went back to borden for ql5s um and that once you've done that you're basically a qualified mmt and usually usually a corporal <clears throat> excuse me from there um bounced around i went to trenton got promoted to master corporal um and then once I got promoted to sergeant, the last course in Borden for our trade is your QL sixes. Um, but all of our trade training is in a computer lab behind the computer doing, um, working in the supply system to do, mm -hmm. to learn the job um, in that regard. Um, the field stuff, you get that education um, in the field when you're out there doing things. Um, and yeah, and it's been great. I mean, yeah, I've sat in trenches from two to four and four to six. I, I honestly can't tell you which shift is better or worse. They're both not fun, mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it's part of the job and it's what we do. And, and it's, it's not that often, honestly, mm -hmm. a couple, couple times a year on an army base. If, if the training cycle works out, usually a spring and a fall X is what you can kind of count on. Right. It's better than winter, I guess, having a spring and fall. <laughs> yeah, well I guess it's debatable. Yeah. It, it is that it is Alberta. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime after Thanksgiving you can count on snow. So Right, yeah. I guess it depends on where you are <laughs> throughout there. And you touched on this briefly, the posting. So how does your posting work? Do you get to do you pick a couple and they kind of send you where the need is, or how does that work when you come out of basic? Or out of your yes. Case. So on my on your threes, they'll um, ask you to submit your posting preferences. So you pick three places you'd like to go. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we always joke that uh, you can write down whatever you want, but for the most part, they kind of already have a plan. Yeah. Um, because you know, in in their defense, they have positions they need to fill across the country. Mm -hmm. um, so I had asked for Edmonton is my number one. Um, Cause I had never been to another province until I joined and went to Quebec for basic training. Right. So I thought if the military is going to pay for it, then why not, why not see the country? So, yeah. um, and Edmonton wasn't a popular choice for mm -hmm. people to go to. So um, I ended up getting that um, Trenton. Um, and then once you're in, um, so once you get here, um, we have a program called EMMA, the, I'm not even sure what the acronym stands for now, employee management. Anyway, it, I'm not sure, sure what it stands for. You could probably look that up, but it's EMMA, E-M-A-A. -A. And on there, we have a spot for your career and you can put in your posting preferences and your career manager will see that. 
there's also a spot for you to write a little note on what you would like to do. Um, and again, it's they take it into consideration, but there's no guarantees that you'll get what you want. Um, you know, some people, a lot of people seem to want to join and then be close to home. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't always work out. Um, you know, everybody from Ontario can't stay in Ontario. You know, everybody from Quebec can't stay in Quebec. So, mm -hmm. so you kind of have to, <laughs> pardon me? We have a big country to, to pull questions across. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah we do yeah, yeah. very big it's, a, it's amazing how many people don't understand that yeah mm -hmm. and um so you touched on this uh your deployment overseas so just to recap you went to afghanistan in 2006 and again in 2010 kuwait mm -hmm. in 2017 and iraq in 2019 mm -hmm. i was just wondering like how do they tell you that you're going to deploy like what's kind of like the lead up to that so 2006 was right kind of in the middle of Afghanistan. So we knew that every other year um, a battle group was going over. So we knew, um, so you kind of just, um, you're there, they try to share the wealth and not have people going over repeatedly um, for a lot of reasons. Um, so it actually worked out for me that I was an alternate and then um, someone got injured and I got picked up late. So I had to rush through some training quickly. And then, uh, which was, which I liked better. Sometimes less notice is better. You just kind of react and go instead of having all that work up and time to, to worry about it. Mm -hmm. um, the tour in 2010 was an Air Force tour out of Trenton. I actually did, uh, spare parts for a new uh plane that the uh, air force had purchased so that one um they just came to me at work and asked if i wanted to go right. so i said yes uh 2016 17 there um literally on a wednesday morning stables parade at the end of the parade they called out a bunch of names and asked everybody those people to stay behind um so we all gathered around and we were kind of like what's going on and then the uh um i think it was a warrant officer the officer said we've selected you guys to go over um in november wow. so that was kind of if you wanted to say no or couldn't go or had some reasons why then that was kind of your time to let them know right away and and yeah so we got lucky that was that was the longest one I did. That was close to nine months. Um, and then um, I was working at one field ambulance and the op cell called me and asked me if I'd be interested in a tour, which I wasn't expecting one from that unit because my position, there was only one spot that my position went overseas and they had closed down that, um, that part of the base overseas so i didn't expect to get one mm -hmm. um but i guess something came down that they couldn't fill a spot and they came and asked if i would go so so i said yes to that as well yeah. i'm currently currently very lightly penciled in to go again but i don't think that one's going to work out wow okay so <laughs> in your almost 20 year career you've almost been over maybe five times if this one works out but... uh, yeah if this one works out it'd be my fifth yeah but but four for sure um i i love them i mean for me in our trade it's the time to go and actually do nothing but your job like you are a material management technician 24 7 for the whole time you're over there um there are some secondary duties um you know they hire cleaners from off the base and you'll have to you know, escort them around camp while they clean and stuff like that. But I mean, for the most part, you're going to be in the shop doing your job um, every day. Uh, real drawback. It depends where you are. Um, for me, the tours I've been on, there really isn't a whole lot to do outside of camp. So it's a little boring that way. You go to the gym a lot. You watch a lot of Netflix and movies um, and you work a lot because there's not a whole lot else to do. But Right. um all in all it's 
I, I enjoy it a lot. And how does your family react when you get, or do you, do you give them a heads up that you might be deployed or is it more kind of like this happened and then you kind of tell them? Uh, no, I usually tell them that I'm, I'm in, I don't, I'm, my mom's a worrier, so, um, mm -hmm. it's tough to tell her cause I know she'll worry, but yeah, uh, I think the big thing is that she, I think she feels like it's war. So there's that risk of, of getting, you know, injured or worse. Um, and it's really, okay, Afghanistan. <laughs> in 2006, Afghanistan was very different than even when it was in 2010. Um, it was still, I think we were what, we got out of there in 2014. So we we're still four years away from, from leaving Afghanistan, but things were much more, uh, calm than they were in 2006. Mm -hmm. um, I would say 06 was probably the only time I felt there was ever a risk that anything could actually happen. Um, and the trip, the tour to Kuwait, and then the second one was mostly Iraq. Even then, um, it, it, yeah, it was the only thing I was worried about was the heat. Mm -hmm. The sec, the second time to Iraq was a summer tour and. Oh. it gets super hot <laughs> wow yeah that's yeah. so do yeah, they that's... kind of like a, a a prep course depending on where you're going um so we get what they call um mission specific training so whatever your mission is they'll go through some different training like cultural briefs and um they'll go through the weather and you know what to expect in the climate and that I mean, all of our stuff is is air conditioned, so your offices are air conditioned and stuff like that. But at you can have the AC set at 19 degrees when it's 55 outside. It feels nice when you walk into the room, but it, after a half an hour, an hour in the air conditioned room, it's still hot. Yeah, and, and it's almost worse because then you go outside and 55 suddenly feels like 65, and it's just yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. And drink uh, a lot of a lot of smoothies. <laughs> <laughs> from your from your perspective of the supply side as well when you're on these deployments and even in your daily kind of work how do you interface with the more combat oriented roles do you interact with them often or are you more kind of just like feeding them the materials they need and they don't really see you as much um so it would depend on where you are so at the service battalion we support them so i wouldn't see um a lot of combat arms guys, I would see their supply techs more so than I would see their, or sorry, MM techs more so than I would see the actual combat guys and, and girls there. Um, but if you're an MMT in the RQ shop at those units, you're going to work with them directly all the time on tours. It's a little bit of a mix. You'll see them a little bit more because it's just, a. uh, uh smaller footprint and in, in where you are they're right there beside you um so like for example when i was at uh one cer um the squadrons as they call them um company squadrons they all have um what we call a, a quartermaster and it's usually that combat arms trade so it will be a warrant officer engineer that will come and, and liaise with us at the shop to get their stuff and make sure they're ordering things properly. Um, so at an infantry unit, you'll be dealing with infanteers um, directly on how to do basically the material management function. They get a crash course on how to do, how to fill out the forms, how to fill out the tags, how to request LPO stuff, how many quotes they need for, if it's a certain dollar value, there's a, regulations on how many quotes they need to provide us in order for us to go out and get them what they're looking for so you'll deal with them a lot more directly there okay interesting um and then i guess just going back to kind of your experience um being deployed i think you pointed out one misconception that a lot of us including myself have which is um that all these tours and stuff are directly like in a war in a war zone i think that's mostly because of you know tv and movies right yeah um yeah. i was wondering if you could kind of just maybe give us a little bit more of a visual kind of walk through what it's like to be there so we can picture it a bit um 
so we use the term Groundhog Day a lot. Um, once you get in there and you get into a routine, I think that would be the best advice I could give people going on their first tour is get yourself into a, a bit of a routine. Um, you know, if breakfast is your thing, um, if you like to go get up and do PT and then go to breakfast, then try to try to do that there. Um, like I said, you have a lot of time on your hands and there's not much to do. So sometimes the facilities are a little limited. So getting up and going to PT in the morning might be good. You might get to the gym and it's packed and think, okay, maybe I'll change my routine and I'll go, you know, after work or because usually any time from four o'clock till 11 o'clock at night, it's kind of hit and miss on when the gym will be busy. Um, so you, you get yourself into a routine right away uh, or as soon as you can. Um, sometimes work will get in the way because obviously you're there to do that job. So it's going to take priority. Um, Afghanistan the first time around was very different. So I was lucky, unlucky, I guess it depends how you look at it. I never went outside the wire as we called it. So I stayed in Kandahar airfield. Um, uh, I would walk from our, we were in tents at that point. So there was eight of us in a tent. Um, you had a little uh, rectangle, maybe six feet by 10 feet, so that was your space. Um, so you had your cot, um, used my barrack boxes as a bedside table, had uh, one of those hanging shoe things in my room for like socks, underwear, t-shirts and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, a laptop if you brought one, whatever for your own entertainment, just something like that. And maybe a lawn chair um, if you brought it with you. Um, there was a little bit more going on then. So the biggest threat we had in that tour was rocket attacks. So they would just randomly shoot rockets in. At one point, it affects everybody differently. So I can only speak for my personal feelings was, for me, it got a little annoying because they bomb us at three in the morning. And I'm like, dude, I'm tired, I wanna sleep. <laughs> Stop waking me up. Um, but, we had a couple, I had two real kind of scary ones, me and some friends that hit the gym after work. Um, the meal facility closes at 8 p.m. So we always went, uh, worked out, showered, cleaned up, and then we went for a late supper around 7.30. And as we were walking to supper, um, we had a rocket go over our heads. Uh, it ended up landing probably 300 meters past us. Um, it's not like it is on TV every single time. They don't always whistle. Um, this one, this one did, but you knew it was close. So we all hit the deck. Um, and it was kind of funny because when, after it went boom, um, the horn goes off to, and everybody's, you go to the bunkers and take cover cause you don't know if more are coming. Right. And, uh, one, one of my buddies <laughs> got up and he's like, well, there goes supper, I guess. So... <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah I, th I think i don't know i've always had like there try to worry about the things i can control i can't control that so mm -hmm. to wander around scared all day just didn't really make a lot of sense to me personally um but again it affects people very differently um i had some friends who did get outside the wire and and from all accounts things were a little crazier out there and a lot more nerve wracking. Um, 2010, when I went over, like I said, things were very, very, very different. They were a lot calmer. I would say that we probably only had four or five rocket attacks over the course of that whole tour. Um, we had, there wasn't a lot of um, incidents of combat outside, like like when, if, if a member, passes away out on the battlefield. We have a, a ramp ceremony for them before they go home. Um, my first tour, um, I did 11 yeah. ramp parades, um, not all for Canadians, but um, I did 11 ramp parades. Um, in 2010, comparatively, I did one. So, uh, sorry, two, one was for another nation. Um, and then Kuwait, um, when I went there, uh, it very like nothing, no rocket attacks. Um, I always called it garrison in the desert. It's, it's like being at home, except you're not at home. Yeah. Um, 
And the only thing that happened there was on my first tour, there was a, a member who unfortunately passed away working out in the gym in Jordan and they flew us to, um, so they flew a small group of us from Kuwait to Jordan to do his ramp parade um, because all the troops that he worked with wanted to honor him by being in line on parade as he went by. So they asked us to come and send a group over to carry him. So we did that. Um, people ask me about that and I'm like, I think they're confused when I tell them that it was it was an honor and and what i mean by that is that i was proud to carry him i would rather never do that again in my career mm -hmm. um but you know he's they're they're a fallen comrade and and it's 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 part of the process um it's an unfortunate part of the process but um it was it was a very different experience i'm glad to have experienced but i'd rather not have to experience it again so um, and then in Iraq, ironically, um, yeah, it was, it was great. There was, there was nothing really going. I think I had one rocket attack in, in Iraq and in, in my 2019 tour and that was it. Um, I left before things got a little crazy over there and in late 19, early 20, things went a little, a little sideways. Um, I had some friends who I was on tour with and I came home and they stayed and they had a little more um, incidents than I did, but it was all in all, it, it wasn't really too bad. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's something that a regular civilian, at least living in our part of the world would not experience, which is, <laughs> is definitely, I can see how it would change you as a person to come back from that, you know, like carrying mm -hmm. your fallen comrades and all of those experiences. Yeah. Uh, and I think like telling stories like this help the general public kind of understand that Canadian army and the Canadian military like is active and we do do operations abroad. Um, mm -hmm. So thanks for sharing that, um, even though it wasn't yeah. the most happy. Yeah. You know, yeah, I think for me coming home from my first tour, coming home, the biggest issue I had was patience. I had none. Like... When you're over there, things are moving quickly. It's busy, it, like it's super busy. You could work 20 hours a day and and with no problem at all and still have tons and tons of work to do. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes tasks come up that interrupt your work, right? We need to go and um, escort in some guys with some kit. So we need to escort them in. And you're like, I don't, you know, you don't want to do it. You're like, I got work to do. My desk is piling up, but you don't, you don't sit around and mope about it. You're, you get, you might mutter as you get up and go, but you get up and go. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So when I came home, the more relaxed, which is kind of ironic because I, you know, once you're home for a while, you kind of feel like in North America, we're just too busy. We're too all over the place. But when you come home, um, you know, little things like, okay, we're going to go here. Um, I'm still big on timings. So if right. you're not like I'm in the army, so if you're not 10 minutes early or 10 minutes late, um yeah. I, I struggled with that a lot i would be standing at the door waiting to go because we were supposed to go somewhere and i'm just tapping my foot like okay like come on let's go yeah. like, <laughs> so i really struggled when i came home with my patience i just i had none like if we were doing something let's go let's get it done and and uh, it took a little while to relax and back that off yeah, I can only imagine. Even just for me, I did um, basic like reserves BMOQ, and I just remember when I came, when I was done, even just that one course, I was looking at my watch every time someone said they'd be here at a certain time. And I'm like, you're two minutes late. That's two minutes. And I was like, yeah, no wait. So, in a small way, I can kind of understand what you're what you're saying there. Um, yeah. And I think before, like off camera, you mentioned that you were golfing somewhere. Do you mind just explaining that experience and how that happened to the military? So my first tour in um, into Afghanistan, we had to stop in Dubai. Um, Dubai was our secret base, so it was actually called Camp Mirage, which was hilarious. Um, <laughs> but the, I, as far as I understand it, the legalities of it was we couldn't just land in Dubai and then leave to Afghanistan. We had to spend so much time in Dubai 
Uh, and I'm, I don't know if that's a passport thing or, uh, or what exactly that was. Mm -hmm. And then you're also limited to how many chocks there are flying in and out of Dubai into Afghanistan. So sometimes you get lucky and you get an extra day in Dubai and sometimes you don't. You land, you get to camp and they're like, yeah, your flight's going out at 11 o'clock tonight. And you're like, okay, I guess we're just throwing on a uniform and away we go. Mm -hmm. um, I got lucky and got an extra half day. So I actually booked through the, the PSP there to go golfing in Dubai. Um, so I got in a round of golf in Dubai. Um, in 2016, on the way home, we stayed in Cologne. And we got um, basically a day and a half for that. So I called ahead and booked a tea time. So when our plane landed, in Cologne, um, I got a taxi from there to the hotel room, had a quick shower, changed into some clothes, civvy clothes, and got in the cab to the golf course and and played 18 holes in uh, in Germany. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, and then I golfed on my way home from my 2010 tour. Um, we had decompression in Cyprus, um, so you're there for three days, I think it was. And one of the excursions you could do was golfing there too. So I've gotten lucky to golf in some different places. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's there's a lot of perks and, and different things with being in, um, you know, the exercises. Uh, even on a regular, like I said, spring and fall exercises, you might be gone for a month. Um, if it's a big one, you might be gone for a couple of months. Um, but when you come home, there's usually you do your post extras, so you clean up your kit, um, get it all tucked away, and then usually there, you know, your bosses will give you a few days off to cover like a day for every weekend you are off, and and that doesn't cut into your annual leave. That's just because you're away for two months. We're going to give you a little time to to decompress and and you know spend some time with your families and stuff like that. So it's. Yeah, it sucks when you're standing in a trench at two and until four in the morning or four to six watching the frost creep over your your weapon and trying to stay warm. But then when you're off for a week and then everybody else is in the civvy world is working, it's yeah. not so bad. <laughs> yeah. And I guess you do get to, you know, travel a little bit too and see different parts of the world, even if it's just a stopover. So that's pretty Yeah, cool. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I spent 24 hours in Amsterdam on my way into Kuwait, uh, my second tour. So, uh, yeah, yeah, there's some there's some perks. Yeah, when you're talking about golf, all I was thinking about is my dad would totally do that, like book the tea time before you land. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, and you know what was really funny with that was uh, there was something wrong with the because it was a military aircraft. There was something wrong with it, and we were delayed. And I'm sitting there, I'm like telling my officer, I'm like, we better get going. Like, if we don't get going, I'm missing my tea time. Like, we got to get this plane moving. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was good. <laughs> so throughout all these experiences, what kind of relationships have you formed? Do you, do you stay in contact with anyone from like your basic um, or? Um, yeah, um, a friend of mine, she's out now. Um, she is a medic. We did basic together. Um, I came to Edmonton. I think she went to Petalawa um, and we actually ran into each other. So basic was 2002. We ran into each other in Afghanistan in 2010. Wow. That's crazy. Um, and then we were on the same chalk home. So we spent our decompression in Cyprus together and got to catch up and, and hang out. So that was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then she got posted so that was 2010. I got posted back to Edmonton in 14. And I think she came here in 12. So we ended up being here and she's out now, but she's still in the area. I think she's moving back to Newfoundland in the summer, this summer. But uh, so yeah, she's there. A girl I did basic with uh, is actually a warrant officer in service battalion with me now. Wow. Um, one of my best friends is a clerk. He's an MWO clerk in uh, Italy right now. Wow. And yeah, that's where he's posted. Um, and we talk, I'd say we talk once a month. We've seen each other. So we were in Borden on our threes together. Uh, he was obviously on the clerk course. I was on the, and the supply one. Uh, and then when I was in Trenton, he was in Montreal. Um, 
So I went to Montreal and we hung out for a weekend there. And then late in my time in Trenton, I took my son to Ottawa to, uh, so I took Cameron to a uh, Flyers game in Ottawa. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> and my uh, my buddy was in Ottawa at the time, so he was at the game. So we met up at the hotel wow. after and had a few had a few beers to catch up. And that would be the last time I saw Bill. Um, but I talked to him, I would say probably every couple of weeks or at least once a month, see how Italy's doing and let him rub it in a little bit that he's uh, <laughs> hanging out over there. But but uh, yeah. So the thing about the military that I love is, like I said, basic. Um, you're into high pressure situations very quickly. So you learn to, um, teamwork is the key. Um, and you learn a lot about people really, really fast. You're spending a lot of hours with them. Um, so the time duration seems short, like it's only eight, 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you're spending, you know, almost with some people, like the person for me, the guy right beside me, um, you're, you're spending like. 14 hours a day with this person, yeah. <laughs> right? You get to know them pretty quickly and, and, uh, and then you get to have some laughs and some fun and, and you go through some ups and downs, um, kind of, it's, it, it's not something that you get in the civilian world very often. Mm -hmm. Um, so you do make really good friends. And I find that for us, you just kind of pick up, right? You haven't seen somebody for five years and you meet them and you're like, it doesn't seem like you, it seems like you just saw them yesterday. It's just, you really seem to pick up where you left off and mm -hmm. yeah, it's pretty cool. Seems like the best types of relationships that you could have, <laughs> you know, like you're very close. You don't necessarily see them all the time, but then when you do, you have lots to talk about. It's like nothing happened. So yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, I guess one other thing I'm wondering about is how often do you kind of work with allied forces? Like, do you ever do like training exercises with them or, um, so here we do when we're, when Edmonton is, um, up for high readiness, we do, um, an exercise. It happens every year in Wainwright because the training area is big. Um, and it's called uh, maple resolve. So when maple resolve is on, we have American troops come up and different nations and we will work with them together. Um, when I'm, uh, when I'm overseas, we would see them more. Now, my first tour, um, we were our own battle group, so I didn't work with them much directly. You'd see them around all the time, every, like you name it, everybody's there. Um, and they all have their own little camps and stores. It's really cool, it's a, it's a town. Like when I went over in 2010, I think they said that the population at Kandahar Airfield was somewhere around 30,000 people. Oh, wow. <laughs> with everybody there um so on my sec yeah in 2010 in the air force world we work a lot with them because a lot of us have the same planes the same infrastructure they're you know they're um the hercules aircraft everybody and nato uses it so um we would talk to them all the time for parts if i would needed a part and didn't have it i could go to the marines uh, the U.S. Air Force, the British Air Force, and asked them if they had any parts. They would come to me and ask if they had any, if I had something they were looking for. Um, it's a little difficult for us uh, at times because at that time the plane was brand new, so it was really difficult for us to to share too much. But you try to work with them because we're all on the same team, um, and and it's pretty fun to do that. Um, I actually got a a coin from the marine u.s marine guy because i helped him out a little bit he got in a couple of jams with some of his aircraft so we helped him out a bit and and so that was pretty cool and 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 they're fun and it's fun to see their camp and how they're set up and the equipment they have um in iraq worked with the um american a lot of their traffic techs the ones who are responsible with the aircraft pallets and loading and unloading the aircraft worked with them quite a bit um yeah it's, uh, it, it, and that's fun that's fun when you get to see how other countries do it it's fun i did an exercise um, in 2005 in fort polk louisiana oh wow and mm -hmm. uh and it's fun working with them um and talking to them <laughs> so when we got there we had our truck just a cube van full of all our kits so rucksacks bear boxes everything 
and we got in and it was like, I don't know, it was starting to get dark. So the truck pulls in and we all line up behind the truck and we're just having an assembly line, right? We're pulling shit off. And then you're like, if you see yours, put it behind you. But other than that, keep it going. We'll lay it all out in two lines and then just come and grab your kit. So we do that and a bunch of the Americans who we haven't really met yet are standing off to the smoke pit off to the side watching us do this. Yeah. So we get out of that, we get inside, we throw our kid on a bunk and then come outside and they're like, man, that was impressive. They're like, what, what, what was impressive? And they're like, we'd still be standing there if that was us trying to sort out our kit. You guys had it done in like 20 minutes. And I'm like, <laughs> and we're all like, that was actually a shit show. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So they thought it was great and we were like, eh, well, you know, but it's just, it's fun when you get there because you see how others do things and and sometimes you have you know you're some great ideas you're like hey that's really awesome how they do that we should be doing that too so it, it works out really well it's fun mm-hmm. wow yeah that that seems really cool i think working with other militaries would just be it's interesting because you can kind of see the parallels but also the differences and especially with allied countries like we're all similar i i think anyways in the way that we do and operate and kind of like our mandates and stuff um but the but the little things could be a little different so it's pretty interesting yeah. Thanks for sharing that. um we're getting to the end of the hour now almost so i just have like okay. a couple more questions yeah sure first one um is there something that you believed about the military before that you don't necessarily believe to be true now hmm. that's a I think I think the big thing that I that I learned was the, the difference between um, basic training and actual base life is almost a complete one eighty. All right. Like in basic, like I said, it's timings. It's here. It's someone's in your face. They're telling you to move. You're going to here. You got. 30 minutes to eat your little supper and and then you got to be back here and do this and do that and the old um the old saying hurry up and wait is not a basic training model it is a real mil like on base model we do a lot of holy crap we got to get this stuff ready and let's do this and then you'll do it and you'll be ready and it'll be like okay we're not sure if we're actually going to do this or not <laughs> right yeah and you're like, okay, so now we're just gonna we're just gonna wait and see what's gonna happen. It's just it, it's almost a complete 180 from go 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 and stuff is happening to you know we've we've got time like here you know let's let's plan this out and and do this and then that switch will get flipped on and off throughout your career. You'll have exercises where you'll be super slow and there's not much going on, and then all of a sudden um you'll have to do a uh you know a commodity run out to the field at two in the morning and you'll be out there from two to six and it'll be non-stop people coming in your trucks are lined up you're passing you know different commodities across trucks to other other units and out that are out in the training area training and then you'll come back in and then you'll have a lull and it'll be like mm. get, get, get some sleep that's the other you know when you're in the field there's always that if you know, when in doubt, rack out. If you don't have anything to do or you're not sure what you're doing, get some sleep. Because <laughs> yeah. you never know when. You could be gone from one in the morning till six in the morning and not be able to do anything but work. Right. And you sat around all day wide awake doing nothing when you didn't need to be. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. As long as somebody knows where you are, hey, I'm going to go lie down. Perfect. If I need you, I'll come find you. <laughs> so, so, yeah. But it's a very, yeah, you just seem to go from even after your after basic and you go to your trades training for me the switch was still on mm. it was still time pt is at this time breakfast is here you're in the classroom seated by this time you march for lunch and then you march back after lunch and you after class is over you march out and then you're on your own after that so it was still very regimented um when you get into here um yeah, I well, I mean, with COVID, things are different, but I can't even tell you the last time I did drill. Yeah, that's what I was going to wonder. It's, it's been a long time since I've done drill. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping I remember it when the time comes, but it's been a long time since I've done drill. Right, yeah. <laughs> I guess there are, like, kind of, you know, it's kind of like a cycle. You're not 
necessarily always go, 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 but maybe you are in certain situations and then you have to kind of adapt. And I found that in my short stay in the reserves, it was very timing oriented during basic, but then there'd be times where maybe we had to get kit for like a certain exercise and we'd be waiting for like three hours or something. You know what I mean? So it's like, you have to yep. learn to wait, but also how to move fast. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And and if you can, if anyone's looking to join, if you can get that switch, like that's the best analogy I can, is when it's on, it's on. And when it's off, it's off. Um, You know, for me, what I try to try to tell my subordinates is that I'm very big on teamwork, right? I'm, I'm, yes, I'm the sergeant. Okay, fine. Um, But even all the corporals, I don't care. Like I, I want to work as a team. I want to have fun while we're doing it, but accomplish the job. and if I have to use the rank, then we will. But I don't want to be that guy who comes in there and is like, I'm the sergeant. You're going to listen and do whatever I say. Well, that's to me, that's I think the, the thing that people need to learn is that um, like when I joined, the joke was, well, I did my basic in Cornwallis and they used to hit us and they used to do this and they used to do that. And then when I was in basic, they would yell at you. Right. And and I'm like, but you got to understand that like I was 30 when I joined. But some of these 18 year olds, their version of discipline when they were a kid was a timeout in the corner. Like you have to adapt, right? right? They weren't, they're not used to someone screaming in their face, telling them what to do. <laughs> Me, I didn't like whatever. I, but if you're not used to that, then that is going to scare the crap out of them. All right. If the sooner you can figure out that it, it's a game and when it's on, it's on, right? If there's certain people in the room, then I become the sergeant. If, if, there's certain people aren't in the room and, and then we're all on the same team and you can relax and just do what you got to do. I think this quicker people can figure out that part of the military, they'll enjoy it a lot more. We're not all, even still, we'll get times where they're like, oh, the, the base commander is going to be doing a walkthrough and, and people will be running around like, oh, we got to clean up this and we got to do that. I'm like, he puts his pants on one leg at a time, the same as everybody else. Like yeah. he, he's just a person, like, obviously be respectful. Don't be an idiot, but mm-hmm. you don't have to run around scared. Mm-hmm. They're people too. Right. I think so. that's, that's really good advice. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe just which question, last question, maybe here. Um, okay. What do you wish the Canadian population knew about the Canadian Armed Forces, if anything? That's an easy one for me. I wish that they could see, I think they see what, how good of a job we do. Um, I think that we're well respected as a military, like from my experience working with other nations, I feel like um, we're well respected and they, they really appreciate us. Um, I've heard stories of obviously different trades, the infantry trades and our special forces guys and stuff like that, where they're highly respected by other nations. And I think that that's awesome. What I'd like the Canadian public to know, to realize is how good our troops are with how little we have. Um, Like our infrastructure at times, some buildings are, are not great. Um, you know, the building that I'm in isn't in the best condition um, and it's difficult to get the funds to fix those things. Our computer systems are are <laughs> a little outdated. I think we're on Windows 10 now, finally. Like we're just, it's, I just feel like we do a lot with very little. And I think that the general public just doesn't realize, um, I think they feel like we get a whole bunch of money and we get to, um, and we have all this fantastic kid and all this great stuff. And, and we do have some decent stuff for sure. And it's gotten better, but I think that they'd be surprised if they were to see some of the, some of the things we work with and deal with, um, that, you know, it's impressive what we can do. Yeah, for sure. Um, technical difficulty. It's a good point to end it up there. <laughs> um, I think you added a lot of value. Thank you for doing this interview. I think like for myself personally as well, even through trying to research and, you know, meet with different people and learn more. This was a really, really insightful interview. I think people are really going to love some of the insights that you shared, especially about your trade um, and your deployments and all that great stuff. So 
Thanks so much for being here, Sergeant Tonkin. No problem <laughs> at all. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Awesome. Thank you so much and have a great day. Yes, you too.